you love cars? Do you love history? Do you love low production value podcasts? Well, if so, you're in the right place. Welcome to the Dorkamoto Podcast with Brian Loans, where we take a deep dive into some of Automobilia's most interesting topics, including history, racing, mechanics, and a whole lot more. This time, we're talking about Fireball Roberts and his 1962 assault in the 24 Hours of Le Mans. Welcome to the Dorkamoto Podcast with Brian Loans. Well, hello and welcome to the Dorkamoto Podcast, episode one. And I'm your host, Brian Loans. For those of you that uh, do not know who I am, I am uh, an automotive journalist, editor-in-chief of a website called bangshift.com. It's been around for about, oh, a decade plus now. I'm the lead play-by-play announcer for the NHRA on Fox, and I'm also a racing announcer that does uh, events all over the country. Along with all of those things, I love automotive history, racing history, kind of an amateur historian, I guess we'd call it. And I'm a person with a computer and a microphone, so I'm highly qualified to make a podcast. This whole thing came about because, ironically enough, of my Instagram page, of which all I do on Instagram is post historic photos and give the background of those photos, whether they be famous race cars or famous people in racing or famous cars in general, heavy equipment, all those different things. And I try to give the background of what's going on or kind of the backstory of the people involved in the photo or the scene that's involved in the photo. And you only get so many characters, of course, on Instagram, and people are only willing to read so much. I got a ton of Instagram comments where they said, hey, you should do a podcast about this type of stuff and kind of take us a little bit deeper inside the stories. And, you know, I thought about it for a while and it seems to make sense because we can take a deep dive or a deeper dive into some of these topics and some of these ideas that um, that are cool in history that a lot of people either forgotten about or they never knew that happened. So that's kind of the theme of this first episode. And I'm going to try as best I can when I make these. And these will not be made with any sort of incredible frequency. I'll try to keep on some sort of a schedule, but once the racing season starts, it gets kind of kind of wacky around here. But what I will say is I'm going to try to work around some kind of current themes, tie things together um, into the current world of either automotive production or technology or racing. And, you know, one of the things that just happened the weekend uh, prior to me making this first episode was the the Rolex 24 at Daytona. Very famous race. Um, It's been a very famous kind of staple in the world of sports car racing now for many, many years. And it has its roots all the way back with Bill France when he built the Daytona Super Speedway back in the late 1950s and included a road course as part of that facility. He wanted it to be an international facility. He wanted it to be seen as way more than just a stock car track. And one of the crossovers that we have seen over the years are NASCAR drivers racing sports cars or racing other forms of, of in motorsport and kind of proving their mettle. Well, at the the 2020 running of the Rolex 24, Kyle Busch, amongst others, um, got into a sports car and performed very well. I mean, he performed, no one should have been surprised how well he drove because he is a multi-time NASCAR racing champion. And the the guy is obviously very skilled, but there was uh, seemingly a lot of astonishment that he was such a good road course racer and that he was able to evolve and learn so much in, in a fairly short period of time with the team. So... Because of that, I wanted to kind of go back to really the original example of something like this happening, which was the 1962 24 Hours of Le Mans. And the backstory is uh, Fireball Roberts, the great NASCAR racer from back in the 60s, competed in that event with a guy named Bob Grossman. They raced for a man named Luigi Cinetti, and they finished sixth, sixth overall and won their class. And it was the first example on the international stage that a stock car racer was more than just someone that held onto the steering wheel and went left in very fast and long circles. So that is kind of the overview of what we're going to talk about on this episode. And, you know, it's it's, it's interesting because all this stuff is a rabbit hole. You can go as deep down into all these topics as you possibly can imagine. And I'm going to try to give you enough but not too much when we talk about some of this stuff. So um, I'm going to try to keep these to a fairly reasonable, manageable length. But I feel like some of the details are more interesting than others. So I will move through the story with what I hope is some uh, some decent speed here. And uh, it's going to be fun. We're going to take a look back more than 50 years into what was going on in racing at that point. Big Bill France's um, kind of expectations for what NASCAR could and should be and how this all came together for an American stock car driver to race with an American road racer under the flag of an Italian guy that was the preeminent Ferrari dealer in the United States. Seems kind of crazy, right? It's all true. And it all happened in 1962. 
So if we're going to start telling this story, we really need to start with Big Bill France because that's really where NASCAR starts and where the genesis of this particular um, event begins. So Bill France, of course, founds NASCAR, kind of leads it with an iron fist, takes it to heights uh, no one really could have ever expected it to go. He had the grand vision for what he wanted that series to become. And part of that was respect on the international level. Um, Like a lot of people that have a lot of power and a lot of influence and are in these positions, Bill France was a guy who was always kind of looking for the next thing. And he was always looking for the next plateau that NASCAR could reach or be a part of. And starting in the late 1950s, um, Bill France began attending the 24 Hours of Le Mans. In fact, in 1958, he took a guy named Glenn Roberts, otherwise known as Fireball Roberts, with him. On a trip, they went over there to just watch the race and hang out and talk to the folks at the FIA, and they wanted to figure out how you know they could get NASCAR involved in this, what is then, and I guess probably is now, the one of the most famous motor races in the world. I would put it up there, obviously, with the Indy 500 and uh, the Monaco Grand Prix. Le Mans is, is prestige, and it always has been prestige. It's been around for a very, very long time. So France decides, okay, this is someplace we need to be. He talks to the FIA officials, and he figures out quickly that um, they're not exactly dying to get the NASCARs in there because at that time, you got to remember, stock car racing, as we know it now, really didn't exist. It was very much stock car racing. It was still a um, a very regionalized, and, and, I, and perhaps that, that's a point that's sometimes overplayed. It was a very regionalized sport, but they did have – racetracks around the country it was just the preponderance of the fan base the preponderance of the supporters were down below the mason dixon line in that southeastern or southern area of the country so as france attends the race and as he kind of starts to build his game plan about about how he can get nascar involved he figures out that one of the first things he needs to do is convince the folks at the fia that the drivers are actually capable of of doing this style of competition they're capable of being a part of this style of racing so his solution is brilliant and simple he adds sports car races to events like daytona they have a road course there so they run events like the continental 250 and some of the other endurance style you know couple hour endurance races and involves many of his drivers in with these fairly exotic sports cars from around the world Um, this starts to at least plant the seed that his drivers are capable of competing Uh, in this style of racing, if not at the Le Mans level, they at least know that the guys can get on a road course and they're not going to bash the fenders in, you know, in the first turn or trying to try to apply the brakes in the first turn. And that really is the way that Bill France kind of makes his entree into road racing. They hold three-hour endurance races there, 1,000-kilometer endurance races there at Daytona. And he's also a big part in forming a group called ACUS, A-C-C-U-S, the Automotive Competition Committee for the United States. And what that is is, and it still exists today, it's a collective of all the sanctioning bodies in the United States. Whether we're talking about IndyCar, IMSA, NASCAR, NHRA, they're all part of this one group that then works with the FIA as kind of a uh, collective unit. That also helped to bring this story to the next level. Now, we have Bill France's role established here. We need to next establish the role of a man named Glenn Fireball Roberts. So Fireball Roberts was a really interesting character, and his nickname, which we've become sadly prophetic uh, near at the end of his life, um, had nothing to do with race car driving. His nickname was derived because he was a very good baseball player. He was actually a really good athlete, despite the fact that he had asthma, which will also play into his unfortunate demise just a few years after the happiness of this story that we're going to tell. He was a great pitcher, and he threw a very hard fastball, and that is why he was called Fireball Roberts. His real name was Glenn Roberts, and... Through NASCAR's formative years of the 1950s, this was a guy who was arguably, outside of Curtis Turner, its biggest star. I mean, Glenn, Fireball Roberts can be considered, at least in my mind, kind of one of the big crossover stars of NASCAR's early era. And uh, he won an incredible amount of money. I mean, in 1963, this guy won uh, $65,000. Okay, that's the equivalent of five hundred and forty thousand dollars today. And that was just on the racetrack. That was not including his endorsement deals and the other stuff that he did. So um, Roberts was an interesting guy. He was quiet. He was unassuming. He did kind of love the race car driver life of that time. You know, the traveling, the the drinking, the partying with the guys. But he was not overly verbose. And he backed up um, most of what he did on the racetrack. 
Now, we have to think about racing in the early 1960s as a different entity as it is today because of the fact that it was so incredibly dangerous. Um, death was ever present, especially in sports car racing, uh, open wheel racing, Grand Prix style racing was incredibly dangerous. Drag racing was very dangerous at that point. And stock car racing was too, although perhaps not as dangerous as some of the other forms of competition at that time. Now, for Glenn Fireball Roberts, his first experience in a sports car style event came back in the late 1950s. And it's important to note that because he was almost groomed by France. At this point, when we look at the things he did outside of stock car racing from 1958 through his uh, triumphant 1962 run at Le Mans, um, he was really kind of groomed by, by Bill France to be the guy, which is interesting because France also got tied up with Fireball Roberts in the creation of a driver's union. Now, Fireball Roberts tried to unionize NASCAR drivers in the early 60s uh, because he didn't think they were making enough money for what the, the danger level of the sport was. Bill France freaked out, banned Curtis Turner from stock car racing for a number of years, um, but somehow... And I believe it's because of the personal relationship they had. Even though Roberts was deeply involved in this movement with Turner, he did not suffer any of those consequences. He was not removed from the sport. He would go on and uh, continue you know, winning races at a very rapid rate, becoming very famous in the process. So when the time came, when the moment was correct, if you will, for Bill France to make the move and move Fireball Roberts or move a driver into the position to go road racing in France, Fireball Roberts was most definitely his guy. When we talk about the things that Fireball Roberts achieved in a stock car, NASCAR stock car, um, it's it's really kind of astounding. He ran in 206 races in his NASCAR career. He won 33 of them, had 32 pole starts. He finished in the top five 45% of the time and in the top 10 nearly 60% of the time. 1962, of course, he had an incredible year, not only at Le Mans, but he also won the Daytona 500 and the Firecracker 250. And that was the year he was driving for Smokey Eunuch, who, like everybody else that dealt with this guy, just loved him. And, you know, we run into certain personalities in racing where people just universally kind of have a negative or a positive opinion about people. And for Fireball Roberts, um, it is universally, universally positive. And again, we'll get into the sad, tragic end of his life, and that may have part of the reason to do with why people remember him so fondly. But his skills behind the wheel of a race car, undeniable. And a guy who would be a millionaire dozens of times over had he been racing in the modern era. So there is an interesting kind of an interesting kind of side to Fireball Roberts where he is a, a very competitive guy. His athletic back uh, background as a kid, of course, comes up a lot. But he was also an asthmatic, and he was a, he was a hidden asthmatic. He worked out three or four times a week, but he chain-smoked. He was a typical of, of a race car driver guy in this era where there was – some degree of physical fitness being, you know, concerned about uh, getting, you know, exercise a few times a week, but you're also drinking seven nights a week. You're smoking three packs a day. So I think that the physical toll incurred by the chemical consumption probably offset the uh, the workout regimen. But either way, um, a guy who definitely uh, definitely lived life to the fullest. And well, he was not as loud a partier as Curtis Turner. Many people would say that he was just as hardcore a guy when it came time to uh, throw down in a uh, in a backroom saloon somewhere in the southeastern United States. So the next guy we got to talk about here is the person that facilitated the race car. And his name, Luigi Cinetti, and boy oh boy is he a character. So if you're a fan of the Ferrari brand in the United States, you probably already know the name of Luigi Cinetti because he was instrumental in growing the brand in the United States. In fact, without Luigi Cinetti, we probably won't even, wouldn't even really be talking about Ferraris being sold in this country. It is a guy, or we're talking about a guy here who really um, rose to prominence in Italy as a race car driver. Okay, was born in Italy, was a race car driver, um, ran the, the 24 Hours of Le Mans 12 times, he won three times there outright, won 24 hours at Spa a couple times. He was um, a phenomenon behind the wheel. He was born in 1901. So this is a guy who lived through World War I, World War II, all the stuff. Um, what's really interesting is that in 1917, he's 16 years old, working for Alfa Romeo as a mechanic, and he meets a guy named Enzo Ferrari, who also was a mechanic 
at Alfa Romeo. And he bailed out of the country. So Luigi Cinetti escapes uh, Italy when uh, Benito Mussolini kind of rises to power there. He goes to Paris and he works as a salesman um, selling Alfa Romeos. Of course, he's been a, um, a mechanic for them, so he's very familiar with the brand. And he begins again to race there. He runs different sports cars. He races in the 24 Hours of Le Mans. Like, you can name one car, name a, a make. He probably drove it there. Um, competed from 1932 to 1953, really without interruption. And in 1954, he entered uh, as a, a race sponsor. He was sponsoring a car. He wasn't driving there. During World War II, he comes to America. And he kind of traveled around... Um, and ended up getting work as a mechanic working on Rolls-Royce engines on the East Coast as part of the uh, World War II effort. His mechanical ability was very, very high. He got the job and worked there through the whole war. Now, as the war is ending, he decides, hey, I, I kind of want to stay here. I have a feeling that I want to uh, I want to become an American citizen. So applies for citizenship in 1947 and becomes a citizen in 1950. The coolest part about his citizenship is that he was his sponsor, his sponsor, which you needed a sponsor, another citizen had to sponsor your application to become an American citizen, was Zora Arcus Duntoff, the father of modern factory performance as we know it, the guy who wrote the the famous memo at GM in 1955 that, that or the early 1950s that brought us things like the small block Chevrolet. So a very neat connection there between Zora Arcus Duntoff and Chinetti. Bouncing around a little bit, the year before he got his citizenship, 1949, he goes back to Paris, finds that the property that he owned there had been completely annihilated in the war, so that was that was going to be a non-starter. So then he went to uh, to Modena, Italy, to visit his old pal Enzo Ferrari, who had opened up a shop, and before the war he had been building some cars, um, beautiful cars, very fast cars, very powerful powerful cars, and he gets to the shop and he finds a guy that. Um, pretty much is 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 heartbroken because his once awesome race car business he was been making machine tools for the italian army he was a government contractor during the war kind of as all war uh time things go you make the things that the army needs they needed machine tools and that's what his automobile plan had been reduced to ferrari was going to quit and we can take this story in one of two ways there is a very dramatic historical element uh or historical telling that says that chinetti went in there and gave Ferrari, the great pep talk, and said, I am placing an order right now for 25 cars, and I will sell them in America. And there's really no way that could have happened because Chinetti didn't have that kind of money. He was dealing with, he was kind of wheeling and dealing cars along with being a mechanic and a machinist in the uh, in the engine plant, but he did not have the scratch to order 25 cars at a whack. So to me, that story's false. It sounds great that he, you know, he grabs his friend by the lapels and, and orders the 25 cars, and he is going to save Ferrari, and Ferrari sends the 25 cars. And not that, that ain't the way it happened. But needless to say, something did happen there because I do believe he kind of reinvigorated, re-inspired Ferrari somehow because Ferrari gave Chinetti the exclusive rights to be the only person in the United States that could sell Ferrari cars, um, which today would be incredible in 1950, 1949, didn't quite mean as much because there were very few people in our country that even knew what a Ferrari was. The good news was that returning veterans really understood European cars more than they ever would have. We, millions of Americans were in Europe driving these small, sporty, live kind of sports cars. And so without the war, trying to deal Ferraris would have been probably a complete disaster because no one would even know what they were. After the war, people understood. And they, they kind of understood the legacy, understood performance in that European vein. So Chinetti gets the distribution on the Ferraris, and because he's a racer, because he is a guy who loves competition, he forms NART, N-A-R-T, the North American Racing Team. It is the least imaginatively named racing team in the world, but it is also one of the coolest. And you know, Chinetti cultivated um, and kind of brought along and made the careers of some, it launched the careers of some of America's most famous, famous drivers. I mean, Mario Andretti, of course, Sterling Moss, an Englishman, Phil Hill, uh, Pedro Ricardo Rodriguez, Graham Hill. I mean, drivers from all over the world, he was able to cultivate them, make them part of NART. They ran and they ran cars that were successful and fast. And um, he even tried uh, to work with female drivers in an era where that was not um, was not really the the most popular thing to do. So definitely a kind of a fearless guy. 
and someone that uh, that knew talent when he saw it. He often said that when he looked for a driver, he looked for a fighter. He wanted a driver that was spirited and that was fearless and that would stand in there and take their lumps and do what needed to be done to win a race. He did not want drivers that were um, you know, lily-handed, easy on equipment. He wanted the fighter. He wanted the fighting spirit. So we have two of the, we have all three of the elements in place here. We have Bill France wanting the international presence. We have Glenn Roberts, Fireball, um, his guy that he has chosen to, to kind of lead the flag on that one or hold the flag on that for NASCAR. And now we have this North American racing team that just so happens to be involved in sports car racing. So the big question is, where does it all come together? And there's no historical record of this moment happening, but the reason and how it happened, let's just put the pieces together, is on November 2nd, I'm sorry, February 11th, 1962, at Daytona, there is a three-hour endurance race, at which point Fireball Roberts drives a Ferrari 250 GT for Luigi Cinetti at Daytona International Speedway because Bill France most definitely set that up. He finishes 12th overall, shows Chinetti the goods, shows Chinetti that he has the guts, and now it's Chinetti's job to find his co-driver for what would be the 24 hours of Le Mans that year in 1962, which would be happening basically four months later. Who does he tap? He taps a guy that he has tapped many, many times before. His name's Bob Grossman, and he might be the most interesting guy in this story. So Bob Grossman was a great sports car racer, and unfortunately, like everybody else involved in this story, Bob Grossman is dead. He's not alive anymore, which uh, Bob Grossman's the kind of guy that I would have loved to have picked up the phone and called because to me, when we think of sports car racers and we think of this this kind of romanticized era of what a sports car racer was in the 1960s, I mean, this guy was it. World War II veteran, raced all over the place. He was the president of this prestigious road racing drivers club with some of the most famous road racers in the country were part of it. He raced at Le Mans, I don't know, five, ten times. He'd been a class champion, a top ten finisher. I mean, this guy was a stud. And adding to that, he was a foreign car dealer, so he was kind of a sports car, sporty car, tweed jacket with the patches on the on the elbows guy. And he was also, yes, a professional baritone singer. Um, he studied at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. He was a professional level baritone. So I don't other than being a Samuel Ye, I'm not sure what else we could add to this guy's resume to make him more of the sports car racer of nineteen sixty two. And again, his story is very typical. We talked about the GIs that came back and understood and, and started to love these these small sporty cars that they saw over in Europe. And he was he was the, one of the few in the proud that took this to the to the kind of highest levels. By nineteen, he starts racing in fifty two. By nineteen sixty, um, the guy is is a national champion. He's winning multiple classes in different cars and everything else. Um, it, it, he was just a great great figure and. I, like I said, I wish the guy was still was still with us. He passed away uh, in May of 2002. He lived to be 79 years old. But Grossman was the right man to be to be the kind of foil for um, for Fireball Roberts here because of the fact that he could help smooth some of Fireball Roberts' edges out. Roberts had great instincts. He was a great driver, he, but he was not in in, in a natural road racer in the way that Grossman was. So Grossman, able to kind of study and understand what the strengths were behind Fireball Roberts, was able to work with him. And who knows if it would have been as successful a partnership with somebody else. The other fact is that Grossman had had such success in surviving the 24 Hours of Le Mans mechanically. He was known as a finisher. And for endurance road racing, especially in this era of time the cars were not nearly as advanced as they are now they were not nearly as uh, as brutally strong as they are now so you really had to know how to work the equipment properly to actually make the thing live for 24 hours and be fast at the same time so it was um pretty spectacular that that chinetti chose grossman and and grossman had been an integral part of the things chinetti was doing with his road racing team for a long time so this is not a huge surprise that he picks grossman but it's another example of Chinetti's understanding of the competition and what needs to happen in order to be successful at Le Mans. So now all the players are on the table, right? We know Grossman, and we know Roberts are going to drive the car. We know that uh, 
Bill France is greasing the wheels to make this happen, and Chinetti is, uh, I'm sure, making a tidy buck on this whole thing because that was, you know, kind of the guy's life story. He did very well for himself, and, and he should have because he was an inventive and smart guy. The car gets to Le Mans, and they begin racing it, and they're qualifying, and they're testing and doing all the things that you do over there, and they realize very quickly after Robert starts making some laps that this guy is better than they could have guessed. The, the, his his finish at Daytona wasn't necessarily dictated by because of the fact he was the 12th slowest guy. They had had some mechanical problems with the car, and what they realize is after Roberts is out there making some making some laps and getting comfortable with things, that he's really fast and he's really smooth and he's not beating up the race car. So Chinetti and Grossman have to be kind of uh, elated at this whole thing. And the one thing that's interesting is of all the stuff written about Bob Grossman, of all the the kind of personal memoirs he's kept. Um, he very he doesn't really mention anything about Roberts. You can find some of these stories elsewhere, but in his own words, he says very little. In fact, uh, in one of his memoirs, he writes, I drove for Ferrari again in 1961 and 62, finishing sixth each, each time. That's it. That's all he said about those two races. Yeah, we finished sixth. He apparently, in some level, I'm not saying he was resentful of Roberts, but probably... A sports car guy who may not have wanted to give too much credit to the stock car guy. It seems so strange that you would have this unique individual experience, a first-time experience for anybody in racing, and say that little about it unless you harbored some sort of, not to say animosity, but perhaps annoyance with it. So the race is not a highly dramatic affair. There's nothing really that we can say about... um, about what happened during the race, that there was some sort of magical moment where, you know, they spread it to the finish line and they were they were just killing it. Um, we can say some disappointment struck them, though. 22 hours into the race, these guys are in second place overall. 22 hours in, they're in second place overall at Le Mans. They're driving a 1962 Ferrari 250 GTO, one of the most beautiful cars ever built, a car now that is worth tens of millions of dollars. Uh, the Ferrari GTOs of the 60s with their V12 engines, they are, in many people's eyes, some of the most beautiful and representative cars that Ferrari ever produced. If you, if we needed to place a Ferrari in a uh, time capsule for the aliens to come look at to describe what a Ferrari is, what would we put in there? A lot of people argue one of those early, mid-60s, 250 GTOs would be the car because kind of a brute i mean the, they were very powerful with that v12 in the front of them you know traditional front engine layout just uh, all the things that enzo loved wrapped into one package beautiful curvaceous lines the horsepower the raw performance you know enzo ferrari famously once said that uh, aerodynamics are for people who can't build engines um which is a great line and it's been attributed to him i hope he actually did say it because it's been attributed to him all over the place but uh that car, it was eyeball arrow, but man, it was uh, absolutely unbelievably gorgeous. So what about Fireball Roberts' experience at the race? And we can get his firsthand words from a February 10th, 1964 story that was written in Sports Illustrated by a woman named Barbara, he- Barbara Heilman. Now, this was sadly um, uh, several months before he would be killed. And, you know, it was interesting... It's interesting to hear him. He he talks extensively about, you know, what it's like to race stock cars, about what he feels, how comfortable he feels in the stock car, and what he has to say about racing Le Mans 1962. Now, this is two years after the fact, and I quote, I've done some sports car racing, Fireball says. I drove in Le Mans in 1962. I liked it. It was very different, particularly the nighttime part of it. We raced at 170 miles an hour with just the headlights. You could only really see far enough ahead of you to react to speeds of about 70. You just had to talk to yourself and say, well, there isn't anything out there. I finished sixth overall. You have a co-driver. Mine was Bob Grossman. We were battling for second place right up until 22 hours when we had some mechanical trouble and had to make a pit stop. I really didn't fit into a Ferrari, he added. I never quite seemed to have enough legroom in there. He continues, I've never had any desire to be a sports car racer. Stock car racing has been my whole life and it's grown in my in popularity and prestige, and the machines aren't that much different. A stock car is a racing machine, just with a stock car body on it. It goes as fast and it corners as well. The only difference is stock cars weigh more and don't stop so well. I couldn't say whether stock car men are mechanically more familiar with their machines. I just don't know enough about sports car men. 
One big difference with a stock car driver, a lot of the fans will root for a certain make of car rather than be a fan of the driver. It's really putting down a man's individual effort, but I think this is the basis for the sport's popularity. People identify with what they drive to the supermarket in. End quote. Pretty neat. And I think that quote sums up who Fireball Roberts is. He was a little bit introspective there. Kind of, you know, kicked it around a little bit. Mentions Bob Grossman's name. And I, and I wonder if there was any animosity between Grossman and Roberts. Because, you know, as accomplished as Grossman was, you'd figure Roberts might say, oh, I was with Bob Grossman, who's won a gazillion things and done a bunch of stuff. He just kind of offhandedly mentions Grossman's name. That part of the story I don't have the depth to find, and I've never been able to research deep enough to find what happened between the two of them. We need to talk now about Fireball Roberts and what happened to him in his career. Um, As many of you know, maybe some of you don't, I mentioned before that his nickname was prophetic as to what would happen to the end of his life. And that was because uh, in Charlotte, racing in Charlotte in 1964, um, he suffered a horrendous crash, uh, ending up on fire on his roof, um, suffered catastrophic burns over the majority, 75% of his body. And he didn't pass away at the racetrack. In fact, it took weeks for him to pass away, and he died of kind of uh, infections and and sepsis, just a very very sad end to his life and when we look at how things are reported in that era we can look at the new york times obituary from when he passed away which was on july he died on july 2nd 1964 and one of the interesting things that's written in the obituary is that they believe that he was able to survive the crash perhaps because he was able to hold his breath and not inhale the flames remember what i said earlier he was an asthmatic pretty bad one and a heavy smoker and he just was not holding his breath in there um it's a sad end to this guy's life and i mentioned the fact that he is so well revered and loved in racing and i think some of that stems from the fact that he had this kind of tragic end the you know the ironies when these situations happen and we see them in modern life the ironies come come rushing out at us um supposedly it was going to be the last or one of the last races he ever drove in he had been hired as a uh, PR guy. He's going to do some promotional work for Falstaff Beer and the brewery. And so this was it. I mean, he was making his swan song in race cars. And for him to uh, for him to, to pass in this way was just heartbreaking. And he was one of the most famous guys in the country. Make no, make no bones about it. Fireball Roberts was on the level of the pro athletes of the day. You don't get your obituary in the New York Times for being nobody, especially in 1964. So Roberts definitely uh, had captured part of the national conscious there. Ned Jarrett actually pulled him out of the car. That should be mentioned. When he had the uh, the flaming crash, it was Ned Jarrett that kind of waded through the fire and pulled him out. His death was not in vain, though. Subsequently, the development of um, kind of the fireproof fuel cell for race cars came because of not only his death but others that happened. But the the fireproof fuel cell, um, the kind of real tipping point in its development, was after Fireball Roberts had passed away. It should be noted that after he ran Le Mans, he also raced in Nassau, driving a Ferrari 250 GTO for Chinetti. Then in 1963, he ran for Chinetti at the 250-mile and 3-hour Daytona endurance races, and he actually drove for the Shelby American team, run by Carroll Shelby, of course, at the 12 Hours of Sebring in 1963. And he shared a car with Ken Miles, Phil Hill, and himself. He also shared a car with Dr. Dave McDonald. Dave McDonald, ironically, would be killed the same year that Fireball Roberts was in an equally horrendous crash at the Indy 500. Finally, in 1964, he did race at the 250-mile Daytona race in a Ford Fairlane, finishing second. Those runs that he made with McDonald and others in the Cobras resulted in DNFs for breakage. The epilogues on the other guys in this story... I told you about Bob Grossman, had a great sports car racing career, passed away, was a vocal artist and everything else, just kind of lived the lives of 10 men. Luigi Cinetti would go on to continue racing well into the 1970s. He would become a fabulously rich man as the sole distributor for Ferraris in the United States for many years. And then um, in the, I believe the early 60s-ish, they took the 
the dealer license and broke it in half. So Chinetti became the Eastern United States Ferrari dealer, but was still the guy. And he maintained his, his presence as the guy for so many years. Chinetti basically got out of the business in the late 1970s, retired and enjoyed the, uh, the fruits of his labor. Um, an incredible life lived by him as well. The dealership that he started is still in business down in Connecticut, uh, albeit under a different name and ownership, but it is still operating there. And um, he had and still continues to have a fairly indelible uh, mark on American sports car racing history. People that buy Ferraris, if they have a Chinetti kind of bloodline to them, they're worth more money. If they came through Luigi's dealership, they have a um, they have more prov- uh, provenance. They have more value. Finally, we can talk about Big Bill France and what Big Bill France did for NASCAR racing and the fact that NASCAR now owns IMSA. And NASCAR is not only just a, a supporter of sports car racing, but an owner of, uh, of sports car racing series. Jim France, Big Bill's son, who currently runs NASCAR, loves Le Mans, has made multiple trips there, was able to wave the flag at Le Mans 19, or rather in 2013. So a family legacy that loves that race and uh, really got things kicked off in terms of uh, moving the needle as far as the respect level for NASCAR drivers around the world. I think the high point for NASCAR drivers in terms of international prestige in the modern times, um, that would have come, you know, just not that long ago. That would have come in 2002. There was an event called the Race of Champions, which happens, I don't know if it happens every year, it happens many years. And Jimmy Johnson, Jeff Gordon, a guy named Colin Edwards, raced against champions from sports car racing, F1, karting, rally, other disciplines. And they were in equally prepared cars on an equally prepared course, and they won. And so in many ways, in 2002, Big Bill France saw the ultimate um, conclusion to this story where Fireball Roberts kicked the kicked the uh, the football off the tee in 1962 by a sixth place overall finish in Le Mans, category winning finish at Le Mans, finishing sixth overall. And then in 2002, three of his most high profile drivers or two of his most high profile drivers went up against the greatest in the world and came out victorious to prove the point that NASCAR drivers do a whole lot more than just turning left. And that's it. Glenn Fireball Roberts is still remembered very fondly in the world of NASCAR stock car racing. He was inducted into the NASCAR Hall of Fame in 2014. And as I mentioned, his loss will move racing technology safety ahead very, very much. So there you have it. That is the first episode of the Dorkomotive podcast. I certainly hope you enjoyed it. hope you learned something. And I hope you understood why this story was a cool one and how it was a good one to kick off this series with. We'll see you again sometime. Not sure when, not sure how often, but I'll be back with more history and fun here at Dorkomotive. I'm Brian Loans, and I thank you for listening.